All right, class. First off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today we're going to be talking about the Roaring Twenties. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the Harlem Renaissance today. Okay, that's going to be our focus. All right. So let's go ahead and look at your warm-up picture. So here it is. My question is this to you: What is this artist trying to say about African American women? Okay, so look at the way they're dressed, look at their surroundings, look how they look, you know, and tell me, what is the artist trying to say about them? Do they look, how are they looking? Do they seem like they're stereotyped? Do they seem like they're, you know, what's going on here? Do they look classy? Do they look trashy? And then don't forget, what evidence is there to back you up on that? You know, so if you say, oh, they look like they're, they're angry, they're yelling at each other, well, explain how. What do you see that's, that shows that? Okay. If you say something else, again, be sure to provide proof of what you're saying. Don't just say, oh, it looks like they're doing this. Or I see five girls. Okay, I see that too. What's that got to do with anything? That's not answering the question. How is this artist trying to depict them? How is he trying to make them look? Okay. So think about it. Write your response because we're moving on in three, two, one all right so the harlem renaissance this movement started in <laughs> harlem new york okay now the thing is it was a social explosion but mainly it was an artistic explosion that spread throughout the country and it had a lot of people appreciating black culture okay now it may have started in the late 1900s 1910s you know um, but it wasn't until the 1920s where it really started to grow and prosper and really gravitate and capture Americans, uh, imaginations and, you know, curiosity and stuff like that. And it basically didn't stop until the 1930s. And you'll find out why, um, later on, why it didn't, uh, why it stopped in the 1930s. So this is known as the golden age of African-American culture. Now, there were four uh, aspects in which it really grabbed on and gravitated to America and people in general. Um, one was literature. Another one was music. The other one was stage art, which is like acting and things like that. And the last one is basically art. Okay. Now, a really quick thing about Harlem, a little quick history. Um, Harlem originally was meant to be like a really rich, upper class white neighborhood. Yeah, it was specifically built to be like a suburb in New York for rich white people. The thing was, though, that this is the 1880s when it was all created and made and some of that. They built too many buildings too quick. And a lot of these buildings and uh, apartments were empty for years. Yes, there were some rich white families that moved in. but A lot of them were mainly like middle class white families. But again, there were so many houses and apartments there um, that there was a lot of empty rooms. And, you know, people who own apartments and things like that. They want to rent those places out because that's money they're losing. You know, they don't get it um, rented out. So this is where in the 1900s, a few black middle class families started moving in. And they loved it. Like, oh, my God, this place is so amazing. so great. They would tell their friends, you should think about moving over here. And this is where some of these white people were kind of racist. And were like, no, 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 no. We don't want you guys here. And they would tell the apartment owners, hey, you need to get these guys out of here. And those apartment owners were like, why? They pay the rent. They're, they're good tenants. You know, they don't cause any problems to anyone, to the building or nothing. They pay their rent all the time. Why would I kick them out? So some of these white people decide, you know what? We're going to leave. And they did. Okay. Um, then in the 1910s, um, the Great Migration happened. Basically, W.E.B. W. E. B. Du Bois um, basically told a lot of Af African Americans in the South, why don't you guys come up north? Forget those racist people down there in the South, you know, come up North. Sure. There's a sprinkle of racism here and this and there, 
But the thing is, it's nowhere near as bad as the South. Now, some people came up north. And then more came because of natural disasters in the South. You know, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, floods, and things like that. So some people were like, you know what? We just lost our farm, our home. Might as well go up north. You know, there's jobs at those factories and so that. So some people went to New York. Some went to like Philadelphia. Um, some went to Detroit, you know, Chicago. And uh, a lot of those who went to New York end up going to Harlem. Now, there is one thing I want to show you guys. And um, the thing is, if you look at that top picture there, because I've been saying it for years, you know, a lot of students tend to think Harlem is a slum. It's a horrible place. It's like a ghetto. But if you look at that top picture, look at all those guys, even the ladies. Do they look like they're wearing rioty clothes and, you know, acting ghetto or whatever? Like that? No, look at them. Suit, tie, hats. Even the girls, dresses, blouses, you know, things like that. Harlem was not a ghetto. Okay. It didn't start out that way. So that idea, that notion that it was always a ghetto. No. It wasn't, okay? So, let's go ahead and talk about literature, okay? The books that were written by African Americans at this time were very creative, great storytelling. The words, the imagery, you know, was just phenomenal. And one of the most prolific writers was this guy, Langston Hughes, the guy you see with the with the smile and the little mustache thing. Um, he is considered one of the greatest writers, not just in the 1920s, but of all time. You know, um, people were actually very surprised when like, oh, this book is so good. Oh my gosh, who is this author? Langston Hughes is a black man. Wait, what? He's a black man? It's like, yeah, people were shocked. But yeah, he wrote some amazing books. Um, same thing with Zora Hurston which is that lady you see up on top there with the hat. Um, she too wrote several books that were just very good. Um, the next guy you see there, that's Claude McKay. And then there were some other authors, County Colon and James Johnson. Okay. Um, and like I told the people in class, I haven't read anything from McKay, Colon or Johnson, but Hughes and Hurston, I have read when I was in college. So next we talk about one of my favorite topics, music, specifically jazz. Jazz was a sound nobody at that time had heard, and it just boomed. It just echoed throughout the country, and people just gravitated to it. People loved it. Like, what is that sound? Dang, that's good. And again, it wasn't just black people saying this. It was white people, too. Just like, wow, this is great music and just you want to get up and dance and stuff like that you know get get the body moving um and like i said in class you guys nowadays would hear, probably hear jazz from back then and be like it just sounds like a lot of noise that doesn't that, that, that doesn't slap you know but the thing is back then it did that was the top music you know so people like louis armstrong you see the guy with the trumpet there i mean phenomenal phenomenal um, even his singing is, he has such a unique voice. Um, the next person who was just, I mean, wow, at that time is the other guy you see there smiling. That is Duke Ellington. The Duke was bar none. Uh, I mean, truly second to none. Best band leader there was. Okay. Benny Goodman and all this. So you can talk about those guys all you want, but Duke Ellington was the man. Then you got people like Bessie Smith. But you see the picture right there. She had this voice that you could just feel her pain if she wanted you to. Or she could holler and just get your, you know, get your vibes going in your body. Just make you feel like, heck yeah, you know. Same thing with Fats Waller. She had an amazing voice, you know. Now, these guys were great musicians. But there was a club that basically just was the talk of the town that everybody around the whole country knew about. And it was called the Cotton Club. And it just so happened to be in Harlem. 
Now, it opened in 1923, and this place was amazing. They had a big, huge ballroom. Areas where people can sit, have a drink, eat a little bit, things like that, right? And then they had a little dance area, okay? Now, in the front, right, right in front of the dance area and stuff like that, they had two band stands. Two areas were for bands. Well, one band who started, you know, when the doors opened, when they were about to finish, the next band would be over on the side getting ready, getting everything set up, ready to go. So when that first band was done, this next band played right when they finished. So the party never really stopped. Okay. And when I mean never stopped, basically it they didn't stop until like past midnight. Now, nowadays you're like, who cares? What's you know, I stay up past midnight. I'm barely, you know, I'm not even going to go to sleep for another five hours. But back then that was scandalous. <gasps> Staying up past midnight? Oh my gosh. What's wrong with you people? Don't you have jobs? My God. So scandalous. So, oh, you know. So you have to remember, the way of thinking is different between now and then. Okay? Just just remember that, okay? Now, here's the problem with the Cotton Club. Yes, they had jazz music. Duke Ellington was, a lot of the times, the headliner. Um, so they had jazz music, African-American music playing. They had artwork from African-Americans from Harlem up on the walls and stuff like that. Um, the problem is African-Americans couldn't get in. It was whites only. Yeah. So like a lot of these white people wanted the experience of hearing the jazz music and seeing the artwork of uh, the African-Americans. But they didn't want to mingle with them, you know. So yeah, some um, yeah, see, is like that's really really bad. But we'll get to that in a second. Now here's the thing: in 1935, the club relocated, took itself out of Harlem, and went somewhere else in New York. But the thing is, those people who always went to the Cotton Club basically said that once it moved, it just didn't have that same feeling. The magic was gone. And eventually it would close um, in 1940. Okay. Now, going back to what I was saying about how whites were only allowed and blacks weren't, some African Americans saw this as like, this is the racist place. This place, um, how can they take our culture, our music, our artwork, and basically say, oh, we're appreciating it when African Americans can't even enjoy it themselves and it's their culture? But then you had another group of African Americans who were saying, no, 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 no. See, you don't get it. You're thinking short term. We're looking at long term. Because, yes, they're listening to our music. They're liking our artwork. You know, yes, they may not like us as people, but they like our culture. And as time goes on, they have kids and they introduce their kids to jazz from Duke Ellington, Bessie Smith. You know, artwork from so and so and so and so, and literature from so and so and so and so, links and news and all these guys. That will then crack that shell of hatred. Their kids will then learn to appreciate our culture, our music, our artwork, and stuff like that. And then they'll accept us more and more. Okay. So that's what they're saying. So some, again, see it as it's a racist place, plain and simple. And some are saying, no. You're not thinking long term. You're just thinking short term. And in long terms, they will come to accept us and uh, because they appreciate our music and art. Now, it came to stage performances. Um, there was a new breath of actors, you know, coming up to perform now. Uh, black actors before this time basically were stuck to stereotypical roles. A lot of times they were the um like the the slave you know the servants of plays you know they really didn't have much of a lead um they were seen they were played as like bumbling idiots and stuff like that you know so they were like the comic people like oh you, you know you're old so and so you're so dumb oh well geez oh. you know so that was a stereotype that they basically had to play in order to get a job as an actor 
But once the 1920s came, all bets were off. They now were in dramas, comedies, musicals, um, historical dramas, things like that. I mean, just anything and everything that they wanted to, they did it now. So that guy you see up there uh, without the hat, that is Paul Robinson. And he basically believed that the arts and cultures was the best way to bring the black culture in front of the white culture. He's like, we do what we do with the arts and, you know, and show people what our culture is all about. You know, people will embrace us and basically enjoy our stuff more than they enjoy the white people's stuff. Now, some other people, actors who became famous during this time, one of the most famous was this lady you see right there. That's Josephine Baker. Um, she is considered one of the most beautifulest women in the 1920s. Okay. Um, thing is, sad thing is, she had to leave the United States. She had to go to Paris. But once she was in Paris, people just were in awe of her. Like, wow, this woman is beautiful. She's so talented and some of that. Um, and again, people were just like, she's fine. You know, so that's the thing. Uh, Nita Bush became another famous actress. Bill Bojangles Robinson, that guy you see with the hat. Um, we talked about him during World War I. How he didn't fight, but he was the entertainer. And he still continued being an entertainer. A fabulous dancer. You know, and if you ever have a chance to go on YouTube, look at some of his, uh, his dancing. It's just like, wow, he's, he's really good. Um, Bill Pickett and Clarence Muse, other actors that came, really came out big during that time. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to art, um, to physical art, many of the painters and sculptors at this time couldn't even go to art school because they weren't allowed because they're African-Americans. They couldn't go to museums and look at Picasso, Van Gogh, or you know, anyone else. Um, they weren't even allowed in galleries. Galleries, art galleries are where people, you know, artists at that time who are still alive could sell their artwork. They weren't even allowed there. You know, so it was hard for these guys to like see other artwork and try to learn how to do certain things with painting and some of that. So a lot of them had to like check out books from libraries and look at the Picassos, look at the um, Monet's, look at the Van Gogh's and see like, oh, I, that looks cool. I, I think I could do that. You know, take inspiration from those guys and create their own artwork. So one of the most famous Harlem Renaissance painters is that guy you see with the glasses there. That is Aaron Douglas. Um, he is considered the father of Black American art. Okay. Another really famous person to come out from this time is the lady you see right there. That is Lois uh, Marlu Jones. Okay. Very, very famous painter. The guy you see right there with the newspaper, that is James Van Der Zee. Uh, another prolific uh, painter. And Clarence Alston was another one as well. Now, when it came to sculptures, the lady you see with that little like deer looking thing, that is Augusta Savage. And she was probably one of the best sculptors, ever American sculptors there was at that time. And she really helped out um, African Americans get into the art world. Okay. Um, now she's famous for one of her busts, and a bust is a statue from the chest up. Okay, that's a bust of W. E. B. Du Bois. But she, what she would do was make basically um, clay models and sculptures of average people, average, average African Americans. And there's one particular one. If you type in her name and put uh, statues, you'll see this one of a little boy with a little hat looking off to the side. And, I mean, if you really look at it, it's just, like, absolutely amazing how this woman made something like that. And, again, it's just, wow. You know, because it looks flawless. You know. But what she did to really help out African Americans was, during the 1930s, uh, President Roosevelt tried to get, you know, the arts really going. 
And Augustus Savage basically said to him and, you know, sent letters to politicians and all that, and especially the president saying, look, how can African-Americans progress in the art world if we can't even be allowed to go to art school, go to museums, things like that? And they were like, yeah, you know, she's absolutely right. So uh, she was the one who helped get the federal art project going for African-Americans in the 1930s. And from there, a lot of African-Americans start signing up, going to school, going, being able to go to museums, things like that. And um, yeah, it's because of her. So she was a quintessential piece in getting African-Americans into the art world. Okay. So uh, that's basically it. Okay. And if you haven't been watching the videos, haven't been listening, um, there is no question at the end because now that is the exit ticket in class. You have to be in class to do the exit ticket. Now, if you miss one or two days, you can get a uh, a word search from me, you know, and uh, that will take care of those, like two of them. But if you miss more than that, you're going to do another worksheet. It's a... Uh, it's an Achieve 3000. You'll need to do that. Okay. And that will take care of that for you. Okay. Um, but yeah. So be sure if you missed. You know you didn't. Uh, you missed a class. This particular class. And you need to get that done. Come see me. And I will give you that stuff. Now remember though. You can only do one word search. You can't do like four of them. And expect to get all your points. And some of that for that. No. Okay. One word search, and if anything more than two uh, days you missed, you have to do a uh, uh, an achieve three thousand, which I will have for you guys. Okay, so hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed this lesson. So with that being said, guys, you take care, you be safe, and I'll see you guys later. Okay.